Welcome back to the Backyard Professor Chess Videos, where I get to have a blast showing you really cool Grandmaster games, and you get to have a blast watching me make an idiot out of myself. Yeah! No, really, I've got a good game. I'm not joking. Um, I've been very fortunate through the years as I've been able to get quite a few chess books, and uh, unfortunately I had to downsize my library five years ago and I got rid of about half my chess library, and I'm really kicking myself in the butt for doing that now, but be that as it may, this game, it's by Jose Raul Acapablanca, the world champion. He had a natural gift, no joke. He never studied it. He just, his natural talent just overwhelmed everybody until Alakin came along and did more study than all of the grandmasters of his day combined and beat him barely. But uh, this game by Capablanca and Tartakover, uh, 19, oh, I forgot to write it down. I believe it was 1928 that they played this, either. Uh, yeah, I believe it was 28. The reason this game is so beautiful, one is because the Capablanca played just straightforward chess. He didn't try to complicate things. That was one of the reasons why Alakin could beat him for the World Championship is because he, he studied his games enough to realize Capablanca kept things simple. And meaning everything was more or less clear. And because of that exquisite uh, talent, he was able to achieve world championship. Alakin complicated everything and he just had a brain like no other. 38 simultaneous games all at once, blindfolded, I believe was his record. 30, 38, I believe. But, I mean, that's amazing. I, I can't even do a half a game. I can't even do a chess opening blindfold, but I'm working on it. But anyway, in this instance, here's a good instance. Capablanca simply simplifies. He takes the pawn. And you go, well, what could be harder than that? Nothing. So the knight Tartikover puts on g4, and then he bumps the other central pawn. Good central location. Tartikover bumps the pawn, and what happens? No complications. No mess, no fuss. No dusting, no vacuuming. Just take the pawn again. Just take the pawn. Keep it simple. Here, Tartikower, it, it actually kind of helped him because he was able to begin developing with tempo, which is kind of nice. He's going to need this, I promise. And now, develops with tempo, hits the knight. Here, here is where we get real interesting stuff. F5 to defend the knight. What does Capa Blanca do? Capa takes the pawn. He's keeping it simple, right? He just takes everything that Tartak over offers him. Notice the effect, though. This is really important. The effect is it is opening up the board, more or less. There's not a lot of pawns clogging the center. So what this is going to tell us is the long-range pieces are going to be really effective. The bishops, the rooks, the queens. Yeah, the long-range pieces. So here we go. E takes F5. Now, here's what's interesting. The bishop is pinned to the queen by the queen. Or... Tartikover could make a discovery on the queen. Yeah, either way. 
So tactics are beginning to emerge, and it's just a matter of simply taking a few pawns in just the first couple open moves, and all of a sudden we're beginning to see possible tactics. Keep your eye on tactics. Well, Tartikover put the queen in front of his king. Don't leave her there. The Tartikover, of course, is not going to do that. But for us, there's nothing wrong with this because there's no way he can access the rooks just yet to pin the queen to the king. But when you see that kind of an alignment, your brain should automatically go beep, 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 beep. Oh, rah, rah. emergency, Will Robinson, emergency, queen in front of the king. Pay attention to tactical motives like that. Or vice versa, if the king is ever put in front of the queen, immediately check the status of your rooks. See if there's something you can do about it, right? In this case, no. This is what I mean. Now, have, did you notice something? Now, I distracted you with the idea of the tactic of the queen in front of the king, and yet I didn't because we want to keep our eyes sharp on stuff like that. But do you notice another tactic that Capablanca could do? Very simple one. Very effective one right here. I'll give you a quick sec. If he had wanted to, he could have done that. And then the bishop could have done that. And then the queen could have went check, and he'd have got the piece. Right? Now, and let's say that that had been the response and he took it. Look at the difference in the positions. The development of black is overwhelmingly greater than the value of the piece that Capablanca would have taken had he done that tactic. Now, granted, it's a tactic, but just because you see an available tactic doesn't mean you have to do it. In this instance, Capablanca felt he could not justify the value of that knight for such an amazing being behind so far in development. And he shows he was justified. So, yes, he saw the tactic. No, he did not do that tactic for the simple reason that Black would have been able to really come on hard with a great attack. And it wouldn't have mattered. See, the the uh, position is basically open. So it wouldn't have mattered where Tart he had the queen and both bishops out. Uh, it wouldn't have bothered him to bring a knight out here. It wouldn't have mattered what side of the board either. Or in the center. Uh, Black would have probably overwhelmed. I mean, Tartikover was a good player too. So anyway, just so you understand, yes, there was a tactic available. Capablanca instead did the wiser move. And I've emphasized this on purpose in my videos because every grandmaster who ever talks about chess does also, right? And we're wanting to improve our chess by analyzing and looking at grandmasters. Not that it means I'm imagining that I'm an expert, but because I'm imagining I can improve by studying how the grandmasters do it. That's what my videos are about. Yeah, helping us all improve. Knight, oh no, 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 sorry. Knight to f3 is a stronger move than spending two moves, three moves to get that knight. Two moves, right? And now the bishop will take the pawn. And I mean, come on, you saw that, right? But look at the development discrepancy already. That is what Capablanca saw and wanted to avoid, and he keeps right on trucking, man. 
Now bishop g5 hit the target. So he's developing a piece. Now, four pieces out on an open field, and two of them are bishops, man. And so to be able to develop with tempo is valuable at this point because Capablanca is behind in development. Yeah, so, so that's a great move. And the knight actually had... Now Tartikover is forced to... Well, not forced. Well, yeah, forced to move a piece twice. Either his knight or his queen, he will have to move twice, which gives Capablanca a chance to catch up in his development, which is very important. Knight c3, and Tartikover does not fall behind either. He says... Yeah, let's get the whole army in on this. Let's do this. And now, again, Capablanca, refusing the one tactic, is able to get a few pieces out, and now he can do a more important tactic. Now, the piece is pinned to the queen. Now, what do you do to a pinned piece? He attacks it so that he can win the pinned piece. That's pretty important to understand in a tactic with the pin, right? So this is why he's doing this. And then queen to, queen to uh, f7, and then uh, he castles. Now, notice the, uh, again... Now, Tarnikover, in his notes to this game, he castled long, and he said, you know what, I would have been better going short. Uh, and I really think he would have, too. And we'll see why. But the idea is, see, he's get, they're getting enough tactics in here. They're getting enough uh, pieces out. You don't want to carry on an attack with your king in the center of the board. It's just not a good idea. So... Castling early is worth the move, really. And so that's what we see him do. So, okay, now, now that things are castled, now we can hot foot it and go fight. Which is exactly what they do. Hitting the center, hitting a target. The target says, okay, I'm game. They exchange... The knights in the center, right? Changing the nature of the setup because now, rather than hitting the, the white squares there, the queen, instead of a knight, is now hitting squares this way, right? Got a pawn here he might have to watch. Yeah. He's going to keep his eye on this knight. Now the other knight is hitting the knight. The queen is now hitting the knight. And the bishop is pinning the knight not to the queen, but to the rook. Because of the way Tartik over castled. Just learn to look and see things like this. This knight might be in real trouble. Right? Now, why would that be so important? Well, let's take a look. The queen took... And now... The central knight, on a good outpost, not a permanent one, but a very good outpost, is putting such tremendous pressure on Tartikova's position that Tartikova says, all right, got to chase him out of here. Right? I just, I got to get him out of here. That's how it works. And now, does Capablanca react to the threat? Yes, but not with the piece that was threatened, but because he has something else in mind. So he takes this knight with the bishop threatening the rook. And the g-pawn will now take the bishop. And they go, yeah, so what? That's right, so what? What we want to notice 
when we're doing stuff like this in our games is in the process of seeing what the board tells us now is Capa Blanca has a beautiful majority of pawns on the king's side and the pawns of Tartakower are shattered. Meaning there's a single isolated pawn there. There's a single isolated pawn there. Those pawns can't be supported by other pawns, so they're weaknesses. From Tartikauer's point of view, they're weaknesses. They need to be babysat, defended. From Capablanca's point of view, they're targets. Now this sets the tone for the rest of the game. Now, but the king is over here. Forget that. That's irrelevant. The targets, the weaknesses, are on the this side, not over here. Forget the king. Go to this side and attack those targets. Watch how Capablanca does that. This is fabulous. He's going to play on the side where he is strong, stronger than his opponent. Uh, that makes sense, right? If a boxer has an abs absolutely masterful left hook, like Conor McGregor in WWF, then for Pete's sake, use your strength. Use that left hook. So you go with your strength, and the strong side for Capablanca is this side. That makes sense on how he's going to play this. Now he's got the entire rest of his game worked out. And the knight is over here, and so is the queen. So, let's keep going here. He hits the knight. The bishop took, the pawn retook, which isolated the pawns, and now the queen takes the pawn, and this is a questionable move. Now, Capablanca got lucky here, for real. This is not a good move. This is a blunder. Can you see why? Unfortunately, Tartik over... I don't know if he was just overawed by the fact that he was playing a world champion or what. Uh -huh. Yikes, I'm dripping all over me. Tartikover said, unfortunately, it's a sad necessity that I have to exchange queens. And then, of course, the knight will take the queen. But was it? Here, Tartikover had a fabulous opportunity, and I want to just show you this. You want to take the time to look at the entire board, not just individual pieces. And, you know, I fall for this all the time, too. Everyone does. But here, I think Tartikover just narrowed his focus too much on the individual pieces. He would have been much stronger positionally if he would have went there. And you go, what? How come that makes any kind of difference whatsoever? Hold on, let me mark this down. The reason that would have made a difference, and a big one, is because now, exchanging the queens, brings this pawn over to the G file, and it opens up the H file for the rook, hitting the castled kingside, and connects the dark squared bishop and he's got the
the white squared bishop. Tartic over would have had a delightful attack here. Right? I mean, two moves, you guys. And he would have had the great Capablanca on the ropes. Yeah! But he was so mesmerized with looking at the individual move that he thought, well, now I have to change queens. Don't ever try hard not to ever get into that mindset of, oh, well, now I have to do this. Always look at your options. That is winning for black. If you think I'm kidding, put that into a computer and see. It's pretty impressive. So Tartic over missed a great chance. Doggone it. Don't we all? So instead, he went ahead and traded queens. And here, I believe, is where the tide turned. The reason why the tide turns here is without the queens, the weaknesses of the king side really show up. There is nothing on this side to oppose that pawn majority. And that's why that hurt Tartikov to exchange the queens. It emphasized the weaknesses. And bishop comes to e5. And bishop comes to g4. Now he's trying to get a target, right? And he's going to eliminate the knight here. And he's going to take the bishop check. So they're both down on an open board. They're both down to a single bishop. Notice that they're bishops of opposite colors. That can be difficult to pull a win out with opposite colored bishops. Usually it's a draw in an end game. And make no mistake about it, we are approaching the end game. So let's see how that was handled. This is also really cool to see how this works. King bumps up, of course. That's not a big check. But now you got to include the whole army. And so here comes the rooks. Rook A to D1. And this is an opportunity for him to secure his side. Because I've been emphasizing Capablanca on purpose just to get you to learn what to look at in relation to the weakness. But the mirror image is available on this side of the board. On this side of the board, Tartikover has the pawn majority and Capablanca doesn't. So it's going to be a race of who gets the pawn promotion first, is what it's beginning to look like. Yeah? You notice that? And now the rook takes the rook. It is time to take it to an end game, according to Capablanca. He's going to try mightily to do that. Let's see how he succeeds, and he does. Now there is literally nothing in his way. He can get his pawns rolling, man. This is why I wanted to show you this game. It's a great pawn race endgame and how he conducted it. He wants to get rid of this pawn. He first off takes care of any back rank problems with checkmate. That's really important in this game because He's going to start using his rook. He's not going to leave his rook passively defending his back rank. He wants to get that rook in the game, but he doesn't want to get back rank checkmate. There are way too many open files. And Tartikover has his rook also. So this is a wise move here. This pawn bump, it's worth taking a moment to do that. Now, there's very little to stop Tartikover's kingside or queenside run. So you can see it's going to be a race. 
Gentlemen, on your marks! Get set! Copa Blanca's already out the gate, and here comes Tartakower. And now he's going to include his king with his pawns. Yeah. Keep them together. I say there's a race here. Technically, it's not a race of speed so much as <laughs> as he keeps zippity doo dong his pawn. So much as a race for doing it smartly because each one of them have a bishop. And those bishops can cover the entire length of that board, both directions. Capa Blanca can start taking out these little guys from way over there, way over here, and vice versa. So that means because the bishops and the rooks are on the board that you can't just get one pawn out there all by himself. You really have to pay attention and keep all of the pawns more or less together. And this is how they conduct this endgame race, as it were. Bishop h6. So what this move does, see how it affects those pawns, yeah. What it does is it prevents him from pushing the g-pawn just yet. He's slowing down the movement. And this is when he brings the rook in. He says, okay, here we go. And Tartikover is going to eliminate his last problem on his side so that he can raise his pawns in. Well... That's what he thought. But Capa Blanca is one step ahead. The coordination of the bishop and the pawn is a beautiful thing to see all the way across all of that real estate. That's fabulous. Tartikova realizes that I'm not going to get it, so I'm going to come back over to here. I'm not even going to waste my time trying. And now Capa Blanca knows I've got insurance. I've got one more pawn, and that's all he would ever need. Unfortunately, it's on the side with the pawn majority if something doesn't work over here. But he's up an extra pawn. He should win this game. So let's get rid of the rooks. Check. He comes up. He takes. The king takes. Now it is truly endgame time. Bishops versus pawns. And... Once again, it's a small, minor difference, you guys. But it's a difference with a difference. The king is closer to his pawns and closer to the center than Tartikovar's king. That could be a difference. C5, they're keeping all of their pawns together. Notice that. Now he can push G4 because he bumped his king up to give this pawn support. They're not just racing one pawn or another. They can't afford to because of the bishops. They've kept the bishops on opposite color bishops, mind you. So the bishops can't fight each other, just the pawns. That's why it's important to keep the pawns together. It's a really instructive concept here. And now hit the bishop, yeah. So, well, you got to... Stay on this side to keep those pawns under control to help, hopefully, keep them from promoting. But I think Capa Blanca's got this, or does he? Because here comes Tartikover. And now F5, and now Bishop G7. He's going to try to interrupt his flow of pawns. And now, whoops. Sorry. I did that wrong. King c6, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. King c6. That's what he did. And then, yeah, and then Capa Blanca went h7, and now he goes to g7 to stop the pawn from... That's correct. And now he hits the bishop. And at this point, Tartikova realizes, okay, the pawns are going to beat my bishop here. So I have to get going here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hot foot it here. And 
king e2. He comes back to keep control of these pawns. Bishop goes to f h8, and he pushes the f pawn. And it's here that Tartikova realizes he's going to promote first. So, that's a great game, you guys. It's a good end game. The crisp, clean, simple lines, the simple strategy, lack of complication, and just straightforward go get the queen first is why I wanted to show you this game. So, thanks for watching Backyard Professor Chess videos. Remember, do good, be well, have fun, be happy, be safe. Halla flippin' Louie, we're alive. Let's enjoy the days as we have them. And I will see you in the next Backyard Professor Chess video.